Hi guys, today is a good day. Today, Sony releases the A6700, the long-awaited successor to the A6600. Now, does it disappoint? Well, let me give you a few of the highlights. We have 4K60, no crop, 10-bit 422. 4K120 with a crop, 10-bit 422 because it shares the same sensor as the glorious FX30, the 26 megapixel sensor. So it has good rolling shutter performance. It has good low light. It also has an AI processing unit. So its autofocus is absolutely bonkers. Humans, birds, animals, even though birds are animals, the last time I checked, insects, planes, trains, automobiles, it doesn't matter. The autofocus is so crazy good on this thing. It can also stream 4K30 straight from the USB-C and also it has no overheating in standard frame rates. This, in my opinion, is the best value hybrid camera in Sony's lineup by a fair bit and one of the best content creation cameras ever made. So let's talk about it. So disclosures, of course, Sony lent me this camera for review. They don't get any input on it. They just sent me the camera and a spec sheet and, uh, you know, no money changed hands. They don't pay. I wish they would pay me, but nobody ever pays me for anything. And I do have to send this back tomorrow, actually. And maybe I won't, Sony. Maybe I'll keep it. No, I won't. I'll send it back. Otherwise, they won't let me review anything else. But let's get right into it. We'll talk about the body and the ergonomics first. I'll be careful not to shake around the camera because it has these jangly little bits right here. These things, I thought they were gone forever, Sony, and they should be gone forever. I uh, The ones that are here on, on this, the ZV-E10, look at that. Those ones all oh, are so much better, you know? Then you don't have the Mr. Bojangles jangling around. And you can take those off. Let's not focus on that. Let's focus on the other things like this deep grip. Check out that grip. Oh boy, oh boy. That's a nice grip. Even when you have a bigger lens on, it's no trouble holding the camera. At least I haven't had any trouble. Here, let me show you. This is a 70 to 350 G from Sony. And look at that. Even though it's a bigger lens sticking out of the front there, I have no trouble just gripping it. I've been holding this. I went out to do some street photography with this. This is fantastic. Like full frame equivalent, you get like 525 millimeters. I could shoot people from like three blocks away for street photography. They had no idea I was there like a creep. It was fantastic. Thing is built really well, a magnesium alloy body, more of like a chunk of metal as opposed to something like the ZV-E1 that I recently picked up, which has a more plasticky feel. This thing feels very solid. Of course, we have our flip out 360 degree articulating screen. I do wish it had the A7R5s, you know, tilty and articulating screen, but that's probably too much to ask for. And I'll check this out right here. We have a uh, switch for the mode dial between photos and video and SNQ, and you can completely separate the photos and video. You just go into the menu and you do the separation of the different things like ISO and uh, aperture and white balance, things like that. So when you switch back and forth, you could be shooting S-Log3, you know, 800 ISO with a weird white balance and then switch it right over to your photos. And then you'd be in your photo settings without having to save them to the memory functions. But there are three memory functions. So you could save three of those for uh, photo and three for video. Really, really great for us hybrid shooters. It has five axis in-body image stabilization and also in video, you can bump it up and use the active steady shot, which applies some digital crop and digital smoothing as well to your footage. Of course, you have a mic jack, a headphone jack, a high data transfer USB-C port for fast charging and also streaming. We'll talk about that in a minute. And uh, it also has a micro HDMI port. That's another thing I would like to see. I would like to see a full size HDMI port, but you know, it's a tiny body. At least it's here on the bottom. I noticed that with my ZV-E1 as well. When I plug in a uh, external monitor, then on external monitor, sorry, grammar police. When I plug in an external monitor, it doesn't get in the way of the screen because it's just down here. And uh, I like that. If you're gonna put it, it's gonna be a small micro HDMI port. At least it's out of the way. Got a red record button up top, a C1 button on the side, C2, C3. And it also has a function, AFN on and uh, AFN on, AF on, then a play button and uh, then the mode dial. But you can customize all of these buttons to your heart's content. So uh, very customizable. And to me, it's enough buttons to have on the camera where I really don't have to dive into the menu. Speaking 
of the menu. It has the new Sony menu, of course, full touch screen, much better laid out menu than the old clunky system, but also it has a uh, extra few functions on the screen itself. And if you don't want those on the screen, you can just swipe them away. You wanna bring them back, you swipe them back in. You can also swipe up to get the quick function menu and you can manipulate your aperture, your shutter speed, your ISO straight from the actual camera itself. And uh, that's good to see Sony implementing this into their touch screens. Now the LCD screen is quite usable in bright sunlight. It's much better than the older screens on the A6000 series and my ZV E10. You can see in the sunshine much better on this guy, but it is only a 1.03 million dot screen. I would like to see something like I have on the FX30. It'd be nice to have that resolution bump, but, uh, but I gotta say, it's quite usable and uh, even compared to my FX30, I don't notice that much of a difference, but I do notice a big difference between this and my ZV-E10. Of course, something a lot of hybrid shooters appreciate is that EVF. The EVF, again, is 2.36 million dots, and that may not sound that impressive, but it's the magnification that will make a big difference here. The magnification is 1.07. So when you're looking through this EVF, it's actually quite a good EVF to look through when it comes to these types of rangefinder type cameras that have the smaller EVF. So it looks quite good when you're taking photos. I took a ton of photos with it. I had no problem at all using this EVF. A lot of times people only look at the resolution of an EVF and they forget about the magnification, which is a big part of the experience. And what we have on the side here is what I think is the biggest drawback of this camera. It is one card slot. So that is going to turn off a lot of people who wanted to use this APS-C camera for professional photography. For professional videography, you could do redundant recording and record to something like a Ninja 5 while recording internally, and maybe that way you could use it in a professional setting. But for photographers who want two SD cards in case something happens to photos that they just can't lose, then uh, this is going to deter some people. And it's too bad. I would have loved to see two card slots in here. I mean, it's not gonna stop me from buying it, but I can understand how it would stop some people. So let's talk about the video specs for a second here, because even though this is a hybrid camera, it is one of the best video cameras that Sony has ever produced, because you can get uh, up to 4K 60, 10 bit 422 with no crop, like I said at the beginning of this fantastic video, but you can also do the 4K 120 at a 1.5 times crop, and you can also get up to 240 frames per second in HD for ultra slow motion. And the codex, it has the HS, the high efficiency codec, the XAVCS, but it also does all I. So if you wanted to do 4K all I, well, there you go color grade to your heart's content. You have even more information and huge file sizes. The image coming out of the A6700 is absolutely fantastic. It is on par with the FX30. As you might imagine, with the same sensor, it produces a very similar image. In fact, let me put it on screen. This is side by side, the A6700 uh, with the FX30. And as you can see, only very minute differences in terms of the color science, very, very similar images, and that is a good thing. But of course you get all those cool new features like the focus breathing compensation, the focus mapping. Now with this AI as well, you can do this auto framing where it keeps you in the center of the frame, or you can actually program it to zoom in and out at 15 second or 30 second intervals. It's pretty cool has a new time-lapse function, so you can just go in, set up your time-lapse, and then it will make the file for you in camera. My Panasonic cameras have been doing that for a while, and I really, really missed that feature when I switched over to Sony, so it's great to see that that time-lapse thing is implemented, so I can just make the movie and then just put it there in my YouTube video instead of having to put it together myself. I'm too lazy to put things together myself. It has the kitchen sink in here when it comes to picture profiles. It has them all, including a Cinetone. I personally stick mostly to S-Log3. And you can also add your own user LUTs, up to 16 LUTs. So if you wanted to shoot your S-Log3 footage, but you didn't want to see that gray screen there, just stick on like I would, like a Phantom LUT or a Paul Leeming LUT, and then I can see what my footage looks like right there on the screen. And since we're talking about video, why don't we just go outside and I can show you another strength of this camera. And that is when you're out there, you know, walking about, doing the old vlogging. This right here is the A6700. I am still under embargo. So we're keeping it under wraps, you know? Don't want people finding out what I'm shooting, letting it go to the internet, and then making me famous the wrong way. You know, I want to be famous for the right things, like my looks. 
and my personality. But look at how good this is as a vlogging camera. This is uh, just using the active steady shot that's here. It doesn't have the dynamic stabilization of the ZV E1. I was surprised that that wasn't in there, but I'm not a camera engineer. I don't know what goes into that type of thing, but I'm walking here at a fairly decent pace in terms of vlogging. I wouldn't want to go much faster than this. Otherwise, I'd be, in fact, I am already out of breath. So uh, I like to walk a little casually while I am doing the vlogging as to not make the audience seasick. I could speed it up a little bit here and look even more ridiculous walking in this park right now. But uh, just a wonderful camera for the old vlogosphere, you know, something nice and lightweight. And you can still, with this 11 millimeters here with the active stabilization that only crops in about 10%, look at how wide this field of view is. And you get this beautiful park in the background there. This beautiful park that is horribly under construction. I'm not showing you that part. Let me see, where is it? There it is. They've got the whole thing walled off, ruining my kids' lives. Well, anyway, that'll be done in a few years. Now, even though I think the active steady shot will be good enough for me in most situations, this camera also records gyroscopic data, so you can run it through Catalyst Browse or Catalyst Prepare if you want to keep it a 10-bit file, because if you do it through Catalyst Browse, you will lose your 10-bit, so you would have to upgrade to Catalyst Prepare, and that is a paid monthly fee. But then there's also a free program called Gyroflow, so uh, you can try your luck with Gyroflow to try to keep your 10-bit files, but the point is, you can go through uh, one of those programs, the free one or the paid one, get gimbal-like footage without a gimbal. So, uh, you know, you can either do it with the active stabilization on or you can turn it off entirely and then just crop in about 10%, I find, is pretty good. I use Catalyst Browse all the time with my ZV E10. I love it a lot and it's nice to have the feature on this, even if I probably won't use it as much on this one because the active stabilization is so good. So in terms of battery life and overheating, it takes the FC100 batteries. So uh, you can actually get up to two hours, a little bit over two hours. I got two hours and one minute of 4K 24 frames per second recording, or you can get 550 shots. And I did experience no overheating in 4K 24 or 4K 30 at all. It just, it went until the battery died and then I started it again and it went until the battery died. So uh, now in 4K 120, I got on average of 19 minutes before the camera shut down from overheating. When 4K 60, I actually am still in the process of testing that and I will write it on the screen now. Now in terms of low light and dynamic range, no surprise here, it performs exactly like the FX30. This is a good low light camera. It's good for an APS-C camera, but it is not as good as Sony's full frame offerings. Just like the FX30, it uses less aggressive noise reduction in the camera compared to some of the other Sony cameras, like my ZV-E10 sometimes looks a little bit cleaner than this guy at the same ISOs, and that's because it's using a more aggressive noise suppression, whereas this is more natural and you can do the noise removal yourself in post and get actually more dynamic range out of something like this compared to the ZV-E10. And you should be able to get somewhere around 14 stops of dynamic range on this guy, just like the FX30. When it comes to rolling shutter, this is a good performer. It is not quite as good as the Sony ZV-E1, which shares the same sensor as the FX3 and the A7S3. Those things are ridiculously great for rolling shutter, but this is much better than something like an A7 IV. It's in between A7 IV and uh, you know an A7S3, much like the FX30. In fact, I couldn't see any difference at all. I mean, it's got the same processor and the same sensor as the FX30. So, you know, of course it's going to have almost identical rolling shutter performance to the FX30, which once again is a good performer. And now let's talk about photos. And while this camera is not going to blow you away with its burst rate, it shoots 11 frames per second in mechanical shutter and 11 frames per second in electronic shutter. And you can use the electronic shutter since the rolling shutter is pretty good. You can go ahead and shoot silently if you don't want to disturb that bossy bride on her wedding day, or that bossy groom. Let's not be sexist here. The real star when it comes to photography is the autofocus. Sony autofocus has been good for years now, but this new AI processing unit, it kicks it up quite a notch. You get uh, a 60% better performance 
when you're shooting humans. 60%, I, I don't know how you can get 60% better than Sony autofocus, but that is what they did. And it's true, you point it at anybody and if they're wearing hats, glasses, ski masks, if they're burglars breaking into your house, you can take really sharp photos of them, no problem. And because it's a magnesium alloy body, you can knock them out with this. And when it comes to animals, Sony says it performs 40% better and I can absolutely believe that. I just took this out to a local park here, recorded the back of my screen, pointed it here at these ducks and it just, yeah, it grabbed them every time. It never lost them. So easy to get photos of these majestic beasts. Also, some dogs walking around, not a problem at all for the camera, but check this out. This is a little chipmunk, tiny little chipmunk with tiny little eyes darting in and out of frame. And it's just, it didn't lose them. I got those photos of that beautiful chipmunk. I call them Alvin. He's a scamp. It's also another feature I like a lot called full-time DMF where you can just have it in autofocus, but at any moment when you want to override the autofocus and switch it to manual focus, you can do that. I like that. Streaming, overall, this may be my favorite feature of the A6700. This camera is going to be very popular with streamers, in my opinion, because you can stream straight from the USB-C cable 4K30, and there's no overheating. I just, I'm recording this after. I uh, am inserting it into the video. I was just streaming for four hours, and because the uh, USB-C cable also provide some power to the camera. The battery just trickles down a little bit. I still had 65% battery after four hours of streaming with obviously no overheating. You can do the 4K 30 on the ZV-E1, but that will overheat on you after about 25 minutes, at least here in my studio. But the A6700, it just goes and goes and is definitely going to be my favorite streaming setup. I love the simplicity of it. Just the USB-C cable right into my computer without the need for a capture card. Now, the only drawback to that is that you can't use uh, picture profiles, can't do S-Log3, things like that, but you just have to use the Sony standard picture profile off. And I'm okay with that because it looks absolutely fantastic, but you can just use it like you would any other camera streaming. If you wanted to add your own LUTs to say S-Log3, just get a CamLink 4K or a Rode Streamer X, something like that, and you're good to go. So when we're doing our conclusions of this very capable camera, then we have to think about the drawbacks. That one card slot is going to deter some professional shooters. I'm sure Sony has done their market research and they think that that's not that big of a deal for people who are buying this camera. And maybe it isn't. I'm certainly going to buy it, but definitely I would have preferred two card slots. I would have liked to see that A7R5 articulating and tilty screen, especially you know, a lot of people are gonna use this for photos and some people like to keep the screen level with their camera and they want the tilty one. And that screen should also be a higher resolution in my opinion. I would have liked to see the dynamic active stabilization that the ZV-E1 has, seeing how that has the AI processing unit as well. There's no product showcase mode on this thing. I find that helpful on my ZV-E1 and my ZV-E1. E10. You can manipulate your uh, autofocus settings, but you have to dig into the menus to do that. I like product showcase mode at the touch of a button, but that's just me. Of course, I'd like to see a full-size HDMI port, and it would have been nice to see a faster burst rate, maybe 15 frames per second. That would have been good for the sports shooters, the wildlife shooters. I think they would have appreciated that. But when you compare the price to performance ratio of this guy, there are a lot of people who will be willing to put up with those drawbacks. I mean, to be able to get 4K, 120, 10-bit, 422, to be able to shoot with no overheating in the regular 4K modes, and uh, also to be able to stream 4K 30 just straight from the USB-C for hours and hours, have that fantastic autofocus, which is clearly second to none, to have a weather sealed body with this magnesium alloy, nice and tough, and to have a rolling shutter performance that is only bested by something like an FX3. You can see why I said at the beginning of this video, this, in my opinion, is the best value Sony hybrid camera that they have ever made, and I will be very happy to own it. And I am very happy that you stayed to the end and watch this video. Don't forget to like, subscribe if you haven't already. I am gonna compare this to a boatload of my Sony cameras. I definitely will. This is gonna be quite the week. Anyway, thanks for watching. We'll talk to you again soon. Okay, bye-bye.